It's time to talk about valuation. Simply put, valuation is trying to figure out what a business is worth. What is the actual thing worth paying for? Now, figuring out what to pay for a business is difficult. And in my situation, I have 14 different individual companies that I've tried to figure out that exact question. What are these companies actually worth? And I created a spreadsheet where I came up with different ranges. Ranges of where I think my companies are undervalued, ranges of where I think they're fair valued, and ranges of where I think they're overvalued. And in this video, we'll be going over this list. We'll be looking at every single individual company, Apple, Vici, Microsoft, Texas Roadhouse, Costco, and so on, and looking at their valuation. What are these companies actually worth? So as always, we have a lot to jump into in this episode. And if you like this type of content, be sure to hit the subscribe button. We have a lot more of it coming out in the future. Now, before we jump into my individual companies and the valuation of each of them, I wanna speak about valuation more broadly. I'm a follower of Terry Smith, who I think is an incredible investor, and he's the fund manager of Fundsmith. In his shareholder letters, he outlines his basic strategy for investing. It is to buy good companies, don't overpay, and do nothing. Those are his three basic steps of investing, and it's led to great outperformance. Now, on my channel specifically, we've discussed a lot about step one, buying good companies. This is something that I've gone over in many videos in the past. Good companies typically have shared characteristics. Like Microsoft, good companies have high returns on capital employed. Good companies have consistently growing free cash flow. Good companies grow their dividend over time. Good companies don't dilute the shareholder, they buy back their shares, increasing your equity. And good companies have strong balance sheets, typically with more cash than total debt. And they don't rely on leverage to grow their business. So we know that Microsoft is a good company. That's a pretty obvious one, but that leaves us with the next question, which I actually think is much more difficult. Don't overpay. That's step two. We can't skip step two and expect to have good results. And in order to not overpay, we have to know what the company's actually worth. And that is what valuation does. So in a very simplified way of thinking about this, I think there's two basic risks to picking individual stocks. And as an investor, our goal is to minimize these two different risks. Risk number one is fundamental risk. The risk that the company's fundamentals worsen over time. Earnings decline, growth slows, cash flows go down, market share loss due to competition, so on. We've seen companies that have eroding fundamentals. That is a risk when picking stocks. What Terry Smith does to minimize fundamental risk, to minimize it, he focuses on high quality companies. These are companies that typically have such phenomenal fundamentals that their earnings don't decline. They're very resilient in all different market environments. Their growth typically doesn't slow. Their cash flows don't go down that much and they have very wide moats that can hold up against fierce competition. So the way that we reduce fundamental risk is by buying good companies. But then we still have risk number two, valuation risk. The risk that even with the company's fundamentals performing well and things going as planned in terms of the company's performance, you overpaid for the cash flows. You simply bought the company at too high of a price. So risk number two is the valuation risk, and that's where we don't want to overpay. So in essence, when we're looking at doing analysis on different companies, we're always trying to minimize these two basic risks, the fundamental risk and the valuation risk. So having said that, let's get started with Apple. This is the top company company in my portfolio with a holding value of 48,000. I currently believe that Apple is undervalued. I think the undervalue range for the company is around 140, which is right around where it's trading right now. I personally think that the fair value of the company is around 180, and the overvalued range, where I'd actually look at selling Apple, is around 220. And again, the current price is 142. And I know that this is one that a lot of people argue with. They center the argument around the PE ratio. Right now, Apple trades at a 24 Ford PE ratio. The S&P 500 trades at a 17 Ford PE ratio. So Apple's trading at a premium in terms of price to earnings ratio of the S&P 500. And that's something that you can look at. I think there's a valid argument there, but I disagree with it. Again, when I look at valuation, I'm focusing on the cash flows the company will produce. The company's worth the future of its cash flows, not the future of its earnings. And the free cash flow yield of Apple is currently 4.67%. That's right in the 4 to 5% range. And when we compare that free cash flow yield with the free cash flow growth rate, we have a company that over the past 10 years has a compound annual growth rate 
of its free cash flow of 11.9%. In recent years, their compound annual growth rate of their free cash flow has actually accelerated. In the past five years, it's 12%. In the past two years, it's 25%. In the past one year, they increased their free cash flow by 26%. So for me, the formula is very simple here. We have an incredibly high quality company that trades at almost a 5% free cash flow yield that's growing its free cash flow at above 10% per year. And in terms of predictability, I consider Apple to have a very wide moat, meaning that I think the company's future profits are highly predictable. I think the company will continue to post record-breaking profit year after year. On a free cash flow per share basis, this is even better because Apple does an astronomical amount of share buybacks. In the past five years, Apple's free cash flow per share growth has a compound annual growth rate of 18%. This is massive growth of the cash flows you actually own of this business. I don't think the company's an absolute still right now where you're getting the best deal ever on it, but I do think the company is in the undervalued range. And I think over the next couple of years, investors will be happy if they bought the company around this point. Number two, we have the real estate category. My second largest holding is Vici with $37,000 of value. The valuation range for Vici is a little bit more narrow. I consider the company to be in undervalued territory at $27 or below. So I'll probably be buying more of it as it drops down to that price during this market sell-off. I think the fair value range right now is around $33 per share. And I think if the company gets up above $37 per share, that's a point where you could look at taking some gains. Now, Vici is a REIT, a real estate investment trust, which means I don't look at the price to earnings and I don't even look at the free cash flow yield to value this company. Rather, I focus on the dividend because that is the main source of return for a real estate investment trust. You're looking for the yield of the company and we have the dividend yield right here. We compare the dividend yield of Vici against the dividend growth rate. Right now, the dividend yield is a healthy 5%, and we can bring up the dividend growth rate right here. The past two years, compound annual growth rate of Vici's dividend is 8.71%. So the way that I look at this is VG is a company that's like a bond. It's a bond that has a 5% starting yield that will grow its yield around 8 to 10% per year. So if you're able to buy a bond that could start with a 5% yield and grow that yield 8 to 10% per year annualized for the next decade, that's probably a decent deal. And I think that's what Vici will be able to do. They'll pay me this current yield, plus they'll give me another 8 to 10% for the next decade. Now, Vici's a fun company because they actually pay such massive dividends that based on my calculation, over the next 10 years, the dividend alone should pay for my initial investment into the company. All the capital that I put into the company this year should be paid back to me in dividends over just the next 10 years. That doesn't count capital appreciation. And then after the 10 years, that's the point where all the money earned at that point is after my initial investment has already been paid back. So this is a company I'm very excited to own for the next 20 or 30 years. I think I'll make multiples and multiples back on this stock. But if you're trying to get into Vici, the price that I'd look at buying is somewhere below $27 a share. Now, moving on from Vici, next up we have another big tech company. It's Microsoft. This is another large holding at $36,900. And this company has been struggling recently, trading down with the broader market. Microsoft is one that I think may shock a lot of people, but I view this company as one of the most undervalued companies in the market. It's hiding in plain sight. It's a massive company. Everybody knows about it. Everybody thinks that it's probably priced accurately, but I completely disagree with the market in this case. I think the undervalued range of Microsoft begins at around $300 per share. That's when I think the company's actually undervalued. The fair value range, I think, is 350, and the overvalued range, I think, is 400. That's what I think are the true value of this company based on a lot of different factors. The company currently trades at $238 a share, and there's a good chance based on this market, it'll go all the way down to $200 per share. So I think this company is heavily undervalued. If you do the math right now, I think it has around 47% upside based on today's price. Now, when we look at valuing Microsoft, we can look at the same things we look at for most companies. The PE ratio is one way to look at it. It has currently a 24 Ford PE ratio, which is a bit higher than the S&P 500. But again, this isn't the primary thing I like to focus on. I really think the free cash flow 
is what investors are truly buying when they're buying a company. You're paying for the future cash flows of the company. In Microsoft's case, the free cash flow yield right now is 3.63%. That's the current yield you're getting when you buy this investment. To put this in perspective, what we could do is compare the free cash flow yield against a risk-free asset like the 10-year treasury. It's basically identical right now. The 10-year U.S. Treasury is trading at a 3.7% yield. So investors are in a little bit of a predicament. For the past 10 years, the case has been obvious. The U.S. Treasury has yielded so low that the option is Microsoft. You should buy equities over buying bonds. But now bonds have gone up in yield, making it so that there's different places to put your money. And now you might think, well, would I rather buy the 10-year U.S. Treasury, which is risk-free, or would I rather buy Microsoft, which has risk? The truth of the matter is, Microsoft is such a good company that I think the actual risks of the cash flows and of the yield of the company are extraordinarily low. In fact, in my opinion, and in the opinion of creditors, Microsoft is such a creditworthy company that it's actually rated higher than the U.S. government. It's like you're buying a risk-free yield, but in the form of an equity. Now, Of course, there's always a chance anything could get disrupted, even Microsoft, but I think that's incredibly low. When I look at the revenue of the company, it's as steady as ever, growing at 17% over the past five years. That is an incredibly fast compound annual growth rate of revenue for a company their size. Microsoft's free cash flow growth over the past 10 years had a compound rate of 8.3%. All right, that's decent. That's better than what a bond will get you. Bonds don't grow their free cash flow. They stay at the same rate all the time. Microsoft is finding ways to actually grow their free cash flow quicker and quicker. And part of that is doing things like growing Microsoft Azure, like growing Microsoft Teams, like buying companies like Activision Blizzard, which adds on more and more incremental cash flow growth. So while you're getting that starting 3.6% yield plus 10 to 15% free cash flow growth. You're also buying a company that has zero leverage, a company that's continually buying back its shares, an average of around 1% per year of the shares outstanding are gone, making it so that the actual free cash flow per share growth is faster than the free cash flow growth. So your ownership of these cash flows are increasing at an even greater speed. And this is why I like Microsoft. The fundamental risk, that risk number one, I think is almost entirely eliminated. They have very little fundamental risk. Risk number two, which is valuation risk, is a concern, especially if the 10-year treasury goes way up. If this goes up to 4% or 5% or 6%, then it may hurt the valuation of Microsoft. So there's still some valuation risk, but right now, I think the risk reward of Microsoft is very good comparatively speaking, and nobody can really predict where the 10 year treasury will be. So in my opinion, the company's undervalued, and I think it's undervalued by a wide margin. If Microsoft trades down to around $200 per share, that's when I'm gonna really be buying more of it, even on top of my already large stake in the company. Now moving on, we're going out of the tech category to the restaurant category. It's time to talk about Texas Roadhouse. This is quite a bit of a different company than Microsoft. Microsoft is worth trillions of dollars. Texas Roadhouse is worth $5 billion. The difference in size and scale is astronomical. But even though they're very different companies, very different sizes, I have actually a similar holding size. I have $36,000 in value in Texas Roadhouse. So this is a very large holding, and it's actually performed incredibly well this year. Now, right now, I consider Texas Roadhouse to be in between the categories of fair-valued and undervalued. I have the undervalued range at $85 a share. So if the company trades below that range, that's where I get really interested and start buying more shares of it. I have fair value at 105 and then overvalued at 135. And currently the company trades at $89 per share. So let's go ahead and take a look at Texas Roadhouse valuation. The company trades at a PE ratio of 18. I don't think that's expensive at all. Based on its historical average, it's traded in the mid 20s to low 30s. So even if you go based off of a PE ratio, which I'm not, but even if you did, the company is at a decent valuation compared to its history. But if we look at the free cash flow yield of the company, that's at 4.07%. That's in that very 
uh, juicy range of a free cash flow yield. You're getting a lot of cash flow at that point. But the thing to keep in mind with Texas Roadhouse is this company is a growth monster. Texas Roadhouse is one of the most reliably fast growing companies of the past 20 years. Its 10 year compound annual growth rate is 12%. In the past five years, it's roughly the same, 12.59%. In the past two years annualized, this is a bit of an outlier, so I really wouldn't look at this metric because that's based on the COVID years from around here to here, but that was 46%. But then in the past one year, it's 14%. So if we remove the outlier, they grow at around 12 to 13% per year, pretty reliably over the past decade and even before then. The cash flow growth of the company is remarkable. It beats out many top tier tech companies. Over the past decade, their compound annual growth rate of their free cash flows is 17%. The five years, it's 23%. The past two years, it's 29%. They've basically gone from making $50 million per year in free cash flow to now pulling in $250 million, multiplying their free cash flows over and over again. And this doesn't come with a lot of dilution. Because they're a restaurant company, and they don't have to hire legions of developers, they don't have to pay a whole lot of stock-based compensation. They basically have a handful of executives to pay. There's no dilution in terms of Texas Roadhouse. In fact, they're doing share buybacks. So their free cash flow per share is actually growing at an increased rate over their free cash flow. So here we have a company that has a starting yield of 4% and is growing their free cash flow anywhere from 10 to 15% per year. And I have a strong reason to believe that Texas Roadhouse can continue this growth. They have the Texas Roadhouse brand, they have Bubba's 33, they have Jaggers, they're licensing and franchising multiple brands, they're opening up new restaurants every year, and they're growing same store sales, same location sales, faster than most food companies. While others are struggling, Texas Roadhouse is flourishing. One last thing I'll highlight about Texas Roadhouse, a category in which this company crushes basically every other company is the dividend. The current dividend yield is 2.18%. So that might not be amazing, but that's pretty good for a company that's growing at the speed that Texas Roadhouse is. But even more impressive is the dividend growth rate of this company. It's incredible. This year, their last dividend announcement just this year, they grew up by 15%. In the past five years, it's 17% as well. So they are not only paying shareholders through buybacks, but they're growing their dividend at 15% per year, which is just incredible. That's something that I really like to see as a shareholder. So in my opinion, Texas Roadhouse has a very compelling starting valuation, a high growth rate, and they use no leverage in their business model. They have no long-term debt. So I think overall, it's very low fundamental risk with very low valuation risk. And in the long run, I think I'll make a lot of money on this company. Now, moving on from Texas Roadhouse, it's time to take a trip to Costco. Costco is one of my largest holdings at $35,000 of value, and I currently still have $5,000 in gains, even with it currently trading down quite a bit. Now, this is going to be a surprise to many, but Costco is overvalued. The company's simply overvalued. I'm not going to try to defend the valuation here. I'm not going to try to come up with some specific model of why the valuation makes sense. It's indefensible. It's a company that I currently hold in my portfolio that I know is likely overvalued. And right now, these are my estimates. I consider the undervalued range of Costco 320. If it gets down to that range, I actually think the company is basically a still. I would be buying it a lot of it at that point. I think the fair value range of the company is a little bit higher than what most people think. I think it's $380 per share. And then I think the overvalued territory is $450 per share. Costco currently trades at 483. So this is the only company in my portfolio that trades above what I consider the overvalued territory to be. In fact, right now, I think I have around 21% downside. The reason that I hold this company, even though it's in that overvalued territory, is simply because it's a company that I'm not confident in my ability to be able to buy this company at a significant discount. I don't think that it's likely to get that opportunity in maybe years. If we pull up a graph here showing the volatility of Costco, it is a very consistent stock with very little dips and ebbs and flows in price. And anytime this company has dipped 10 or 20%, anytime it's trading below its 200 day moving average, that's almost always throughout its entire history been a good time to buy the stock. So when I look at Costco, I consider it to be 
a very consistent company that always trades at a little bit of a premium, 20 or 30%, and very rarely does it ever dip. One of these dips was caused by Amazon announcing that they'll buy Whole Foods. That was the dip right here. That's the opportunity you had to buy Costco at a discount. But that was it. Quickly, the dip was gone and Costco was off to the races. And then we had another little dip right here that you could buy the company, but it was overvalued at that point as well. The same story goes on with Costco. It's continually, always, perpetually overvalued. So I've decided to try not to time this company. I bought my initial stake. I thought I bought it at a good price and I'm holding on to it. I'm currently in the green by around $5,000 and I'm fine holding this company for the next 20 or 30 years. In my opinion, Costco will not be the fastest growing company in the market. It won't be the best performing company in the market, but it will be, in my opinion, a market beating company over the next 20 years. I think it will outperform the S&P 500 over a 20 year basis, and I think it will outperform many of the cheaper, the so-called discounted companies in the market over that time period. So that's why I hold this company right now, even though I think it's overvalued. If I was gonna buy more shares, I would look at buying them at around 380. If Costco got down to 320, that's when I'd really start piling on more shares. I'd probably double my position at that point. But as of right now, trading at 480, I'm not currently buying the company. I'm waiting for it to maybe give me another dip and I'm gonna be patient with it. Now we're moving back from Costco into the restaurant category once again. We have the quick service restaurant Starbucks and this currently is a $27,000 holding. My valuation of Starbucks has remained consistent over the past year. I think the company's undervalued below $90 per share. I think the fair value of the company is $115 per share. And I think the overvalued range is when you get above 130 per share. Currently Starbucks trades in the undervalued category in my opinion. Starbucks' valuation is very simple. The company currently has a free cash flow yield of 3.1%. And I estimate that Starbucks' free cash flow growth will be above 12% over the next five years. So I basically think that this company has a decent starting yield and a high free cash flow growth rate. Their free cash flow growth has been a little bit all over the place recently, specifically because of COVID shutting everything down in 2020. But regardless, over the past five years, they've still grown it by 8%. Then in the past two years annualized, it's been 18%, which is a very strong growth rate from 2019 to 2021. And with their initiatives and the things they're doing and the way the secular growth trend is going towards buying drinks every single morning and Starbucks really leaning into their cold beverages, these caffeinated cold beverages, I really think they're going to be able to keep up this 15% or above free cash flow growth rate. A starting 3% yield with a 15% free cash flow growth rate should give returns of above 12% per year. And I think they'll be able to do that for years out in the future. So for me, Starbucks is currently a buy. I think the company will continue to grow at pace. I think their China business will eventually recover. And I think their dividend will grow at around 8 to 10% per year on top of the capital appreciation. So I think overall, the total return of Starbucks is going to be market beating over the next five years. Now, next up, moving away from Starbucks, Starbucks, we can go into the financial category. We have JP Morgan Chase here at a holding value of $17,000. I currently think that JP Morgan is trading somewhere close to undervalued range. At around $100 a share is where I put the range of being undervalued. Fair value I put at 140 and overvalue I put at 170. Right now it's trading at 106. Banks are one of the few categories of companies where I don't use normal valuation metrics. I don't look at the PE ratio of the company. I don't look at the free cash flow yield of the company. I look at the price to book. That's what I'm focusing on when I'm trying to value banks. And right now, again, this is subjective. A lot of this comes up to opinion, but JP Morgan is a very high quality company in terms of banks. It's one of the most conservatively well-ran banks in the world. And so I think this company should trade at a higher price to book value than many other banks. I look at it and I see that right now it's trading at 1.3, which is low based in its historical average. Usually it trades around 1.5 and that's where I think fair value is. So 1.5 I consider fair value. For JP Morgan, I'd consider trimming or selling the position at 1.7 to 1.8 price to book. But right now at a 1.2, I don't think that it's overvalued. I think the company, if anything, is close to that undervalued territory. And one of the main reasons that drew me to banks and the reason that I like investing in these companies is because they offer a very good starting dividend yield, 3.67%. That's right now almost perfectly what the 10-year treasury is. 
So you're getting around the same dividend yield as a 10-year treasury, but you're taking on extra risk when you invest in a bank over buying the treasury. The benefit of buying a bank over a treasury is the dividend can go up over time. We can see these big increases. Over the past decade, JP Morgan has increased their dividend by around 12% annualized. Over the past five years, it's been 12% as well. But because of different capital allocation requirements, they've been announcing that they're keeping the dividend steady for now. They're not going to give us raises. And that's something a little bit disappointing to see. Either way, the way that I look at JP Morgan right now is just a constant cash flow of money paid from the dividend that I can reinvest into different companies in my portfolio. So I don't see any immediate reason to sell the company. Once it trades up in value to $140, $150 per share, that's when I'll look at exiting the position. Now, moving on from JP Morgan, we have to go back to the consumer category and we're looking at Disney here. This is a company that's been relatively disappointing because of all the issues the streaming category has had. I currently have a holding value of $13,800 in Disney and I'm currently down $7,600 in this holding. This has been my biggest loser in the entire passive income portfolio. The biggest loser is none other than Disney. The reason that I currently hold Disney instead of selling out of the company and putting the capital into something else is I see more upside than downside. That's basically the way that I would phrase it. I think the company does have downside if they don't execute well, but I think a lot of that downside is already being priced into the company. I put the undervalued range at 130. So that's where I think the company's in that undervalued category. Disney currently trades at $96 per share. I think the fair value of the company is around 150 and overvalued range is 180. So my valuation of Disney and the current price is way out of whack. They're not even close together. I think that there's around 55% upside right now based on my estimates. The metrics right now don't look great. On a PE basis, Disney trades at an 18. Okay, that's all right, a little bit more than the market, but on a free cash flow yield basis, Disney trades at a 0.69. But that's something where I think the metric, the true economics of Disney are being a little bit hidden. For example, when we look at Disney's EBITDA, this is what this chart looks like. Notice how the business was doing its thing all the way from 2001 up until 2019. Business as usual, Disney has a bright future. Then all of a sudden, they introduced something called streaming. And they spent a lot of money on streaming to all of a sudden compete with Netflix, compete with Apple TV+, Plus, compete with Amazon Prime. They had to transition their business, and Disney made, I think, a very difficult decision, but a good decision made by Bob Iger, which is to cannibalize your own business to save your own business. The bad move would have been for Disney to not go into streaming to try to preserve the economics of their cable business. That would have been a poor choice. They could have preserved the economics of cable a little bit longer, but ultimately Disney would be in secular decline. What they did instead is divert all their cash flows from their normal business operations into streaming operations, and that brought the EBITDA way down. But then Disney had a double whammy. They also went through COVID in 2020, which shut down their parks and their most profitable part of their business. So they had their operating income drop like crazy while they're also boosting up their streaming service, throwing all their cash flow back into streaming. This double whammy made it so that their, their actual cash flows dropped something like 33% annualized. If we look at this on the free cash flow chart, it doesn't look any better. Disney was a company that just a few years ago was generating almost $10 billion in free cash flow. Last year, they generated $2 billion. So you can see the massive hit that both COVID and the streaming service has taken on the company. But again, this isn't money that's all being wasted. This is money being invested in Disney Plus, in Disney Hotstar, in ESPN Plus, in all of their streaming ventures. They're also buying Hulu, they bought the Fox Media properties, and they have a lot of tools to work with, and now they're building out this direct-to-consumer distribution network to replace their cable ventures. They're increasing prices, they're operating their parks efficiently, and I think over time we're going to see some dramatic free cash flow growth. I think that Disney will be able to grow their free cash flows back up to previous levels. The question for Disney shareholders is how quickly that will happen and how quickly the cable side of things will erode. Because Disney does have a declining cable business and the cable business has really good economics. So as the cable business is declining, 
they're having to fight this uphill battle of growing their streaming business. But I think Disney will be able to ultimately do it because of their brand and franchise strength. Now, this company is one that I actually consider to be higher risk than most of the other companies in my portfolio. And I'm currently not building this position bigger simply because of the fundamental risk. Remember we outlined those two different risks, the valuation risk and the fundamental risk? Well, in Disney's case, I think the valuation risk is actually minimized. The company's trading at a low valuation, but I think they have fundamental risk. If they don't execute well, the company could perform really poorly. And they're one of the companies that has the most debt in my entire portfolio. They currently have $50 billion in long-term debt and only around 13 or $14 billion in cash. This nets out to $33 billion in long-term debt in an environment where interest rates are rising and that debt's gonna become more expensive over time. So that's what I don't like about the company. I don't like that they have one part of their business that's in decline. I don't like that they use a lot of leverage. I do like the brand value and the franchise durability of the company. And I do like that they're willing to cannibalize themselves to move to a more modern platform, which is streaming. So right now I consider the valuation risk of Disney to be very low. I think it's undervalued, but I think the fundamental risk and the execution risk of the company to be relatively high, higher than I would like. I think Disney has a lot more chance of fumbling their fundamentals than a company like Microsoft or Costco or Texas Roadhouse. I think these companies have much more predictable fundamentals than Disney. So that's my take on it. Right now, I think it's undervalued, but even though it's undervalued because of how unpredictable it currently is, I'm not currently adding to the position. Now, after Disney, we have another company right in the consumer category, which is Church & Dwight. This is a consumer defensive company. I've currently been building my position as the company's traded down with downward momentum. I currently have a holding position of $10,700. Now, I view Church & Dwight as being reasonably undervalued right now. I view the undervalued category around $80 per share, fair value being $100 per share and overvalued being $120 per share. And it currently trades at $72 per share, which puts it in the nice undervalued category. Church & Dwight is basically a holding company that buys these different brands. They try to grow the brands and over time they have a big portfolio of lots of different high quality brands. Usually they're first or second in their category. And I view the valuation of this company as fairly simple. It currently has a 4.8% free cash flow yield. That's in the category that I look at right at 5% for these consumer defensive companies. And they're growing the free cash flow at typically around 10% per year for the past 10 years. This rate has slowed down a little bit over the past half a decade, the past five years at 7.6%, but I still think they'll be able to keep up a five to 10% free cash flow growth rate. If the company currently trades at a 5% free cash flow yield and grows its free cash flow 10%, that should give a 14% annualized return. If the growth rate slows down a little bit to 5 or 6%, then the return is more in the range of 8 to 10%, which I still think is a decent risk reward given the stability and predictability of this company. You can see that their free cash flows are a bit more predictable than most companies in the market. So I like the risk reward of Church & Dwight. I don't think this is gonna be the most flashy company or amazing company, but I think it's one that's gonna consistently give between eight to 14% annualized returns. After Church & Dwight, we have Pepsi, another consumer staple company. Pepsi is actually one of the companies in my portfolio that I think is trading right around fair value. I put the fair value around 175 for the company. I think overvalued range is $200 and then the undervalued range is 150. If you have a company like Pepsi in your portfolio, you have to know the role this company is gonna play. It's gonna be an anchor, an anchor of stability during highly volatile times. It'll be a company that keeps its value and has lower volatility when other companies are going crazy, going down 50 or 60%. That's the role that Pepsi plays. It's never gonna be the fastest growing company and it's never gonna be the one that gives the highest returns. Pepsi currently has a free cash flow yield of 3.4%. The free cash flow growth over the past decade has only been 2.23% annualized. If we switch this over to free cash flow per share, it's slightly better, around 3.5% as they're doing a lot of share buybacks. But looking at the company, the growth has actually sped up in recent years. Since 2018, the growth has accelerated at 13% per year in terms of free cash flow because of a lot of initiatives the company's doing. They're expanding their brands, they're making it so that they have better investments in their distribution network, they're partnering with different companies like Starbucks, and I think they're doing a great 
job overall. And then outside of the free cash flow yield, we also have a starting dividend yield of 2.7%, and they're dedicated to growing that dividend over time. You can look on the chart here, they've been growing the dividend for like 100 years. And then you can look over the past 10 years, and they've grown the dividend around 7 to 8%. So Pepsi plays a role in my portfolio as being a very defensive company. I have a lot of very aggressive companies. I have companies like Texas Roadhouse growing 16% per year. I have companies like Starbucks expanding all throughout China. I have a lot of aggressive bets already in the market. And I want Pepsi to be one of these companies that's a little bit more reliable, a little bit more stable, and a little less volatile. So that's why I currently own this company. Now, next up, we have Nike. This is a company that I've been recently increasing my stake in. It's growing to a bigger position, even though the company's currently taking a beating. Right now, my holding value is $7,700. Now, I don't think that Nike is the biggest still in the market, but I think the company's actually getting into the category of being somewhat cheap, being in that undervalued range. I put the undervalued range at $85 per share, and just recently with today's sell-off, they're down to $83 per share. So I think that Nike's currently undervalued. I put the fair value estimate at 110 and overvalued range at 140. Now Nike dropped 12% today, and that's a pretty big drop. This happened because of their earnings call yesterday. Even though they beat their earnings per share and they beat their revenue estimates, Nike has one big problem. Their inventories are piling up. They ordered so much merchandise because there was such a long wait time for inventory that they weren't getting shipments on time to their customers. So they're frustrating customers, so they ordered a lot of inventory ahead of time to solve that problem. But wouldn't you know, all that inventory came very quickly along with their seasonal inventory, and now they have levels of 60% more inventory than they need. So they just have too much inventory, now they're having to slash prices, which means their margins are gonna go down. This is a struggle that in my opinion is very temporary in nature. And I know that the market and investors are all concerned about this. This is a reason to panic and move to the exits for Nike. In my opinion, I view this all as very short-term issues. So even though a lot of investors are selling out of the company because of these inventory issues, in my opinion, it doesn't change my feelings on Nike at all. Currently, the company has a free cash flow yield of 2.6%. This is a lower free cash flow yield at a starting point than most companies in my portfolio. But Nike's also growing their free cash flows faster than most companies in my portfolio. Nike's grown their free cash flow at 13% annualized for the past decade. 13% free cash flow growth. And even adjusting for share count, because they're actually doing share buybacks, your equity in their free cash flows is growing at a faster rate, 14% for the past 10 years. If we look at the five year, it goes down to 12%, but that's still very quick free cash flow growth. You can see this over time is growing their free cash flow quicker than most companies in the market, and I think they'll be able to continue to do that. Now, on top of Nike's impressive free cash flow growth rate, their growing dividend, they're also a company that takes no risks. They're a company that has a very conservative balance sheet with more cash than debt. So you're not leveraged with this growth. You're not putting the company or the shareholders in jeopardy. So in my opinion, Nike is certainly not the biggest steal in the market. It's not the cheapest company out there, but I think it's a very high quality company trading at a little bit of a discount. And in my own valuation, I think it's undervalued. Next up, we have Target. This is a smaller holding in my portfolio. We're getting down to the ones that are only a couple thousand dollars. I currently have $3,000 of value in this company. Around 700 of that is gained. So I'm still in the green on this company, even though it's gone through a very difficult year. I view Target as being currently in the undervalued range. It's trading right at 150, and I put the undervalued range right at 150. I think fair value is around 170, overvalued is around 190, based on the current environment that we're in. When I look at Target, the reason that this company isn't a bigger holding, even though I think that it's currently undervalued, is there's other companies in the same category that I simply like better. In terms of retail, I like Amazon and Costco better. I think Costco is the king of physical retail. Costco has expanded all across the globe and has had widespread success in different countries outside of the US. Target really struggled to expand in Canada. Ultimately, they failed with that venture. So when I focus on different retailers, 
and I look at the very long-term prospects of them, I think Target's a good company, but I just don't think it has as much potential as a company like Amazon or a company like Costco. And that's the reason that it's currently a much smaller holding. Now, looking at the valuation, Right now, the valuation metrics of Target are very deceiving. The free cash flow yield is only 0.6%. So this would make it the most expensive company in my portfolio. But this is not really accurate. Remember that one quarter they had where they booked a lot of losses because of temporary logistic issues? That dropped their free cash flow down to minus $2.3 billion. So this minus $2.3 billion is being factored into the calculation of their free cash flow yield. And that's making it look like the company is incredibly expensive right now. In reality, if we normalize this and went back only two quarters and then calculated it based off the previous four quarters to that, the company would have actually around a 6% free cash flow yield. That's the way that I look at it. I try to normalize it. Right now, Target does have on a normalized basis a much higher free cash flow yield. Now again, even though Target's a good company and it's one of my portfolio that I consider to be relatively undervalued, right now for me, the company's just a hold. Now next up, we're moving to an entirely different category, which is industrials, and we have the railways, Canadian Pacific Railway. This is a brand new holding to the portfolio. I only put $2,000 into it, which to me is just like a watcher position. Now looking at Canadian Pacific valuation, Again, we use the very simple formula of comparing the free cash flow yield, the starting yield of it, compared against the expected growth rate. Right now, the starting yield is much lower than most companies at 1.7%, but the growth rate is much faster than most companies. Canadian Pacific's free cash flow growth rate has been nothing less than incredible. Over the past five years, they've grown it by nearly 19% compound annual growth rate. 19%. Over the past two years, it's 26%. So they're doubling their free cash flow every couple of years. That is pretty incredible. From 2020 to 2021, it went up 90%. So the formula is pretty simple. If Canadian Pacific can continue to grow their free cash flows anywhere the same rate, anywhere close to where they have over the past five years, for the next five, this company is undervalued. It will be a really good performer. But that's the big question mark. And that's the reason that right now I haven't poured more money into this company. So that's the reason that Canadian Pacific remains a very small holding in my portfolio. I do think numerically right now the company's undervalued, but I've just been reluctant to pour more money into it. I think for now, I'm going to continue focusing on other companies. Now, the last company in my portfolios in the financial category, which is T. Rowe Price, a small holding at $1,800. I think that T. Rowe Price, numerically speaking, and based on its history, is arguably very undervalued. I put the undervalued range starting at $130 per share. Right now, T. Rowe trades at $106. I put fair value around $150 and overvalued around 170. So let's go into these ranges. T. Rowe Price right now is usually one of the favorite companies of dividend investors. We're drawn to it because of the high dividend yield. It starts at 4.47%. Over the past five years, they've grown it at 16% annualized. That's a very strong growth rate. And while they've grown the dividend above 15% per year, they're also a company that has no leverage. They have $4.6 billion in cash, and they literally have zero long-term debt. So they're a very conservatively operated company. And while all of that looks good, even what looks better right now is the company has a very low PE ratio, a Ford PE ratio of 12, and a free cash flow yield that's a staggering 13%. So why is the company doing so poorly? And the stock is down 45% year to date, even though the company looks like it's doing so well? Because things are starting to reverse. T. Rowe Price is not a consistent company. And that's my biggest gripe with this stock. The earnings per share of the company grows during good times and it gets crushed during any type of market volatility or bear market. You can see the EPS going down 57% over the past year. So even though numerically, I consider this company to be cheap. It's an inexpensive company. It's arguably undervalued. When I look at those two different risks, I'm trying to minimize valuation risk and I think that that's mostly minimized in T. Rowe Price. But the other risk I'm trying to minimize is fundamental risk. And that's the aspect of T. Rowe Price that I don't like. I think the company's fundamentals get crushed during any type of market volatility. And I like companies that have more consistency. So when I look at T. Rowe Price, 
even though the company's cheap, I'm currently not buying any of it. And the next time this company gets into fair value, the next time we get out of this cycle, I'll be looking to exit this holding. So this is it. This is my valuation ranges of all of these different companies. Keep in mind, some of these are going to be wrong. I can't see the future and no investor gets 100% of their investments correct. That literally never happens. Even an investor as great as Charlie Munger gets things wrong from time to time. He bought Alibaba last year multiple times as it traded down. He even went as far as to buy it using leverage, which he ended up having to sell out later at a big loss. The company is currently down 45% over the trailing year. Aswath Damodaran, who is also an incredibly intelligent investor and people refer to him as the Dean of Valuation, has loved Meta basically all year. And the company is down 60% year to date. He's also really liked Amazon since the beginning of the year, which is again down 33% year to date. So even the best investors in the world, the ones that study valuation in and out, are going to get calls wrong from time to time. So the best thing we can do as investors is try to get more of them right than wrong. I think out of my portfolio, there's going to be a few that I get wrong, but I think the majority of them will be right. So that's all for this episode. Let me know if you like this type of content by hitting the thumbs up button, by subscribing to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one.